Warren Buffett is joining us this morning after the 50th anniversary of Berkshire Hathaway. And Warren, what did you think of the weekend? It couldn't, have, it couldn't have gone better. I mean, we had a record crowds, we had record sales. We all have everybody had a lot of fun. I mean, I, I didn't see anything but smiles, and uh, uh, I, I didn't have anything to do with it. Everybody else did the work, so I could I could brag a little bit about it. But it it, it was it was terrific. We ran out of seats, but uh, there are worse things than that. Did you get a final number of how many people were actually here? Yeah, there's really no way to get a number. I, I know it was a record. I know it was well over forty thousand, but. Uh, they were just all over the place, so I, I don't have a number. For almost seven hours on uh, Saturday morning, you sat and took questions along with Charlie Munger from your shareholders who were here. Andrew and I were both going through a lot of those questions that came in. And I'll, I'll tell you, I got thousands of um, uh, notes that came in from shareholders, sh thousands of questions. Um, uh, but if you're looking for the most newsworthy topics, there were a few that came in much more frequently than other questions. The issue I think I got the most questions about was Clayton Holmes mm -hmm. and an article that had been written in the Seattle Times. Um, this is an article that was written about a month ago uh, that uh, accused Clayton Holmes of predatory lending practices and exorbitant fees when it comes to mortgages. You took on some of these issues, but can we talk through this right now? Sure. Okay. So what do you say, first of all, just to the premise of the article, that, that Clayton issues predatory loans? Yeah. Well, Clayton does something very unusual in, in, in lending money. It, it keeps the loan. And when a loan goes bad, there's two people that lose money, the, the, uh, the person who owned the home and the person who made the loan and, and kept the loan. And if you go back to the 2007, 8, the, the housing bubble, <coughs> a good bit of that was uh, caused because the person that originated the loan immediately sold it or securitized, packaged it, and sold it maybe even in Europe or something of the sort. So they, they had no skin in the game. They, uh, they sat there and collected a an origination fee and perhaps a servicing fee, but if the loan went bad, it didn't cost them a dime. Uh, Clayton followed um, a much more responsible uh, policy of, of, of keeping loans, and if a loan went bad, it cost us money and it cost the, the borrow money. And so we had strong motivation to make good loans. Now, we were lending to people. Seventy percent of the houses that were sold at less than $150,000 last year were manufactured homes. And we sold half of them. And there's no question that you're dealing with people with lower FICO scores, people whose jobs aren't as secure. And uh, so you expect some foreclosures in a situation like that. Our foreclosure rate has been around 3 percent. Uh, we've never had a loss to an investor on a securitization. Uh, we make very clear to the buyer of a home from us, we make very clear that they have a wide choice of whom they buy, borrow the money from. Uh, here is here is the loan form. Excuse yeah, me a second. Yep. Here is the loan form that every buyer sees and signs. And it's hard to read this. It's well, a it's yeah. A you might read the document. top of it, uh, it's, but it's but it's it's not much more than a half a page. Yeah. There's no small print. It may look small on a TV, but there's no small print. And at the very top. Wait one second. They're yeah. shooting in on this right now. Sure thing. Okay, but at the top. It, at the very top, it says we recommend selecting more than one lender to compare offers, and then we list the various lenders. And maybe they're a local bank. And there's a there's a. Uh, uh, credit union in San Antonio that lends, we lend, and we list the terms. And we also have a lender board in every retail operation, and that lists all the terms. And at the very bottom, when they finally decide who they want to send their applications to, it says, by signing below, you are confirming the retailer or the employee did not recommend, refer, steer, or otherwise. Uh, otherwise influence your decision of lender or lenders to whom your credit application was sent. If for some reason you would like to send your application to an additional lender in the future, you may be asked to complete an additional copy of the form for our records. I think some of the specific cases, though, that this story laid out, they looked at four or five individual cases, maybe maybe even more than that. And in some of these specific instances, the allegations are that the Clayton Homes offered one family a 7 percent loan, turned around, it was a 12 percent loan that they later, they're painting it as a bait and switch, essentially. Um, and obviously there are a lot of cases, but in some of these specific cases, it sounded like there was pressure that was put on some of these individuals. Well, all I can say is that 300,000 loans were made in 
the last three years, people frequently write me and complain about an insurance settlement someplace or but they bought a TV set someplace of one of our stores or something. I have not received one letter, and all the letters get to me. I have not received one letter from Clayton Homes, and we've sold in that period maybe 75,000 homes. We have 300,000 mortgages, uh, and we have been examined in the last three years by 98 different state, uh, well, we've been involved 98 times by state regulators, 98 times. We're, we're licensed in just about every state. and. In 98 cases, uh, we were fined. Once we were fined 11, 000, or once we were fined 5,500 dollars. Uh, got the fines right here. Mm -hmm. uh, once we were fined 1,400 dollars. We fined 1,400 dollars by Tennessee in 2012. We were fined 3,000 dollars by Michigan in 2013, and. I think we were fined fifty-five hundred dollars by one other uh, one other year, and and that's from ninety-eight state examinations. So ninety-eight times the state regulators have come in and checked us out, and that's what they have found while examining our loan files. What again? You make the point that there were over three hundred thousand home loans. This is focusing on a very small number of them. But what about in these particular instances? Do you know if the article is correct? If the authors of this article were correct? In the situations of a few heartbreaking stories, where again, if the article is to be believed, it sounds like a Clayton Home representative put undue pressure on these people, baited and switched, did a bait and switch when it came to some of the prices that came through. That's what I think shareholders had trouble with. There are a lot of shareholders who read this who thought, "Is this really what our business is?" Yeah. Doing? Well, they get they, they they get they get the form. They can send their application in to any group. And any any bank that's on that list, including their local bank, and the local bank makes more loans than anybody else. But you're, you're speaking broadly. I'm speaking very specifically about these individual cases. Yeah. Do you know in these individual cases? I, I don't know the individual cases, but we've got 300,000 loans, and I I don't doubt that some people didn't wouldn't understand making a loan. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that if 300,000 people make a margin loan uh, in buying stocks, and some of them don't understand what they're doing. But I don't see how you could have anything written more clearly than that loan application or the lender board that describes the terms from every lender that uh, wants to be out there for our loans. And, and there are many cases where if they get in trouble on their loan, we give them modifications or something of the sort. We cannot, for privacy reasons, name loan by loan what we have done with anybody. We're, we're prohibited by doing that. So uh, I remember that one time uh, there was a national televised program about, not about manufactured home loans, but other loans. And, and they had a woman there who was very unhappy about losing her home and all that. Turned out, when they examined it, she'd refied it four times up to way more than she'd paid. <laughs> and, and, but, the privacy law, uh, the privacy rules, keep you from responding to that. Okay, uh, you you mentioned that of these loans that you put out. Again, these are uh, often these are loans that are made to individuals who probably don't have great FICO scores. Right. They are individuals who maybe have a little more tenuous income that's coming they're in great, at some they're situations. They're a greater risk. They're a greater risk. You, you said that about 3 percent of the loans go bad. Yesterday, the Seattle Times took that number because you used it at the uh, shareholders meeting on Saturday and said that 3 percent annually go bad. But if you look at pool of mortgages over a period of time, that number would be much higher. They, they took an example from one of your competitors where they said their loans annually went bad at a rate of 4 percent, but if you looked at that same pool over eight years, it was closer to 20 percent. Their implication was that the numbers would be similar at Clayton if you looked at the, the same pool over a number of years. Are they correct in that assumption? Well, they're, they're correct that, that in any case, whether you're talking about car loans or you're talking about, uh, you're talking about Freddie and Fannie's loans. I mean, they, they give you the foreclosure rate by year, and it's true that if somebody is in the fifth year, that would be added. But that's true of all every foreclosure rate that you read. And, and our foreclosure rates for these people who generally have poor FICO scores, have jobs that are less secure, our foreclosure rates were considerably lower than a great many of, of, of the mortgages uh, that people borrowed on uh, in 2007, 2006 from all kinds of other organizations. But everybody has foreclosures. I mean, if you, if you just help the people that absolutely were certain to pay, like me, you wouldn't, you wouldn't sell many homes. And a lot of people would be denied the chance to get homes. I mean, some people take some risk in, in, in putting down a 5% down payment. 
the average the average payment on our loan is under six hundred dollars per month for principal and interest. Uh, you saw the house we had there for sixty nine thousand five hundred dollars. It's right. twelve hundred square feet, a couple of bedrooms, includes the appliances and air conditioning. You have to supply the land, but. Uh, you know, it's 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 bargain living, uh, but it's being offered. You know, you're not buying one, and I'm not buying one. And people that are buying them are people who, if they lose their jobs, are, are probably going to lose their home. But if they lose their home, and we have the mortgage, we lose money too. We have no interest in putting anybody in a house that they're not going to be able to pay for because we're going to lose money. Well, that's a place you, you you definitely lose money in every case because the, one of the things the article pointed out is that these homes, unlike other homes, get repossessed like cars. They'll come up and pick up the home right off of the property and take it away and resell it. But you're definitely losing money every time a loan goes bad in this situation. Well, maybe there's one time when we haven't, but we lose money. On, on, uh, we lose significant money. Uh, well, I can tell you what we lose because the average loan uh, when we take it over, it's only 40000 That's another reason interest rates have to be higher. These are much smaller loans that you're servicing. And our, our loss runs about 40% of the mortgage balance. So uh, if, if we possess a loan of $40,000, we probably lose maybe 16000 A lot of times when people leave, if there's a divorce or they lose their job, uh, they don't leave the house in the best of condition. They, we find the rugs torn up, and that's where they, not everybody does that, obviously. But, but uh, if, if they have no equity in the home and they're mad, for, for, for one thing, they stay in it for a while and don't pay us anything. I mean, they got a rent-free house for a while, and, and, and some of them behave kind of badly when they leave, but I can understand that. Okay. Well, uh, Warren, thank you very much. We've got a lot more to talk about this morning. In fact, when we come back, we're going to talk about Berkshire's big four investments. We will be catching up with the CEOs of IBM, Coca-Cola, Wells Fargo, and American Express. We'll hear what they have to say about business, the economy, and having Warren Buffett as their largest shareholder. Welcome back to Squawk Box, everybody. We are live from Omaha, Nebraska. The chief executive of Berkshire Hathaway's Big Four Investments were here over the weekend. These are the companies that Berkshire Hathaway is the largest investor in for big blue chip stocks. IBM's Ginny Rometty, American Express' Ken Chenault, Coca-Cola's Mutar Kent, and Wells Fargo's John Stump. Together, they represent over 60% of Berkshire's $117.5 billion portfolio. I sat down with the group and asked them what it's like to have Warren Buffett as their biggest shareholder. Warren has been with us the longest, and uh, he owns 14.88%, but who's counting? <laughs> uh, and uh, it's really fantastic. One of the things I always talk about is that great leaders are people who capture the hearts and minds. And Warren captures your heart and mind because he's so passionate so engaged, so authentic, and he wants to win. And so this disarming manner masks this fierce competitor, but he's a real gentleman. Anybody have things to add to that? We've been very fortunate to have um, Warren not only as our largest share owner since the 80s, but also on our board for 17 years. It's been a wonderful journey, uh, and it continues. Uh, unabated, and it's, uh, he was at our annual meeting this week on, on Wednesday. Everyone loves him, uh, and everyone, he's able to simplify complex matters in just a few words, and I think that's an incredible uh, asset uh, Mutar, all the time. You even got him to play the ukulele. Well, he, he's a great ukulele player, so <laughs> I, I, it didn't take much. Well, we're the newest in his portfolio and uh, almost 8%. And uh, I have to say, you know, having Warren, it's a wonderful thing to have someone who's got such appreciation for setting a gold standard for that style of investing. And I know, I mean, all of us are brands that have endured decades and decades and decades. And it is great to have an owner who has that view about investing, that you make the right decisions to create value for the long term, and that you keep moving your own company to higher value and balance that with shareholder return. I would add just what Ginny said. Uh, I talk to him, not often, but maybe once a month or so, and it's generally about very long-term things. And I said, Warren, you're 84 years old. And he's talking about things 10 and 20 years out. He really has long-term views, and he understands the core element of, uh, elements of what builds shareholder value over a long term. It's so refreshing because we all have analysts we meet with every quarter, which we also love, 
<laughs> but equally, <laughs> equally, but we really like our long-term investors. You know what's really interesting, I think, is Warren's uh, long-term commitment, but the fact that all of our companies have really strong brands, and yet we're working with someone who probably has one of the strongest yeah. personal brands in the world. And so I think the congruence of having someone who really believes in a very strong reputation and sustainable long-term performance is absolutely critical. Well, Ken, let's touch on that point. You said that he has a very strong world brand himself. Is he different from other shareholders? Is it different dealing with him than it is other people? Or is it just the perception because we know who he is? I think, for me, Warren has a very unique style. I, we have a number of different shareholders. I get along with them very well. But there's something that is incredibly engaging from the first time I met him. I, I, I agree with Ken. I, I, I find him both inspiring, we learn, but if, and I, I bet I don't share a unique sort of experience that he asks more questions. Mm -hmm. And it, it, is, it is questions, and it, great questions, and whether they're about the long term, about competitiveness, and it's just, you know, he listens more than he actually talks. But when he does, you always take away. As there is not a meeting I have, I don't walk away with a great learning. I agree with Ginny and Ken in that I think there is no one else that I know of that is as keen an observer of trends, of people, of countries, of what's going on in the world, not just in business, but just general trends. And being able to just bring those out in the most simplistic way and articulate those in the most simplistic way. And then the second piece is the fusion of humor and humility. That's right. I don't know that in anyone else that, that is of any stature. Um, so I think that those things, you know, when you come here for him to drive you in his own car to a place to <laughs> right. eat, uh, uh, and, and th but th those are really important things. So, you know, if you th say, Becky, what advice, it's not just something that comes out of his mouth, it's about his whole attitude about the way he lives and the way he adds value to everybody that he, he's in touch with. They're being picked up by him That's in right. his car <laughs> yes. is That's a right. real thrill. Yeah, I mean, he comes to the airport, he picks you up, and he drives down, and you go to the, you know, either garages or Piccolo Pete's into his, the room he is in, and he says, They'll say, what do you want, Warren? And Warren said, I'll have the usual. And I thought, well, you know, I'm a usual guy. I'll have the usual also. <laughs> I didn't realize the usual was a T-bone steak with a side of fried chicken, mashed potatoes. <laughs> I mean, it is a big plate of food. He loves it. Don't forget I, the cherry. I, don't forget the cherry. Coke. Cherry Coke, right. exactly right. <laughs> and, and, and he also might take Dairy Queen. But, <laughs> exactly. But, but I think one of the things that, to me, personifies Warren, and I think we've all had this experience, right? You call Warren, how are you doing? never been better. Oh, yeah. That tells you that he's always looking to the future and it's informed optimism because this is not someone who is afraid to face reality and to tell you what the deal is because he has a mind like a steel trap. But that phrase, I think, really personifies what Warren Buffett is all about. Again, those are the CEOs of the big four companies that Berkshire Hathaway has in its portfolio. And Warren, the thing that struck me the most from hearing from them is that every one of them said uh, it was your long-term vision uh, that they appreciated the most. Now, obviously, you're looking at things for the long term. One of the companies that you told me you've been buying more stock in is IBM. You told me that on Saturday, that in the first quarter you bought more shares. We will see that coming out in SEC filings soon. And I just wonder what you see in the long haul for IBM, because there have been a bunch of people who've, who have questioned why you got into that stock right now. What do you see happening over the well, long haul? Well, I think haul? 10 years from now that they'll be earning a fair amount more money than they are now, and I think they'll have a fair amount fewer shares. So our percentage ownership will be up, and I think uh, we'll make considerable money. I can always be wrong on any stock, but, uh, but that's my best estimate. I felt that way when we started buying it a few years ago. I think they had a billion, 165 million or something like that shares out then. They have 985 million shares out now, so our interest has gone up 
five, 15 or so percent without us laying out a dime in that respect. And it's true that, that they're going through a transition in terms of the product, many of the products their customer li uh, customers like. But if you looked at those people uh, on that program, uh, Wells Fargo's a huge customer, American Express is a huge customer, and my guess is that 10 years from now, Wells Fargo and American Express will be huge customers of IBM. They'll be selling them different things than they're selling them now, but they'll be solving the problems that those companies have at that time. And, and you know, that, that's my best estimate. I can be wrong. There was, there was a story from Reuters, um, I, I think it was last week, just before the meeting came out, questioning the idea of the competitive moats um, that you always look for in companies, questioning whether they could continue when it comes to, uh, this article pointed out, IBM and Coca-Cola in particular. What, what do you say back in response to that? Well, I would say that if you have 1.9 billion eight-ounce servings of your product being consumed around the world in 200 countries by people who consumed it yesterday and are going to consume it tomorrow, uh, I, I would say that that's a pretty strong competitive position to be in. If people like something today, they usually like it tomorrow. And, and usually as their kids come along and more people inhabit the world, they like it. So here you have a product, we'll take Coca-Cola. It started in 1886. And maybe during the war when they had a little trouble getting sugar or something of the sort, maybe there were some declines in, in total consumption. But per capita consumption of, of uh, Coca-Cola products has gone up almost every year since 1886. So you have to be doing something right. Our, our ketchup at Heinz, you know, started in the 1870s, and people are still putting it on hot dogs. So. Uh, I, I don't think I don't think somebody's, something's going to change dramatically tomorrow on that. Mm -hmm. Andrew, you have a question too. Hey Warren, how are you? Uh, one of the things you said this goes back to Go IBM. Ahead. One of the things you said mm -hmm. on Saturday uh, was there's been more stupid stuff and stupid stuff uh, stupid stuff written and stupid stuff done when it comes to buying back stock. And one of the big questions about IBM, of course, is how much stock they've bought back over the past decade. I know you've supported their efforts to continue buying back stock. Do you wish that they had? Uh, bought back all that stock when the stock was higher? Well, I, I, I mean, obviously, you'd like to buy every stock at the low tick, but that doesn't happen for them or for me. Uh, but overall, their stock repurchase program, and it, even I think it goes back even more than a decade, I, uh, has, has been dramatic, and it's been enormously beneficial to the shareholders. And incidentally, while they've reduced their shares, they also had, I think, something like 250 million shares of options outstanding uh, 10 years ago. The options are now down to a few million. So they not only got, they not only reduced the number of shares dramatically, they, they practically eliminated this fantastic overhang. So we look at, you know, buying, buying in stock can be extremely dumb. It can be extremely smart. It was extremely smart for Henry Singleton and Teledyne, and I I won't give you the names of people where it was extremely dumb. It all depends on whether you're buying the stock right. for less than it's worth. I don't know. Did you get a chance? And, and to, we think that. I was going to say, did you see uh, Larry Fink uh, about a couple weeks ago put out this letter uh, saying that he thought that companies these days were buying back too much stock and, and, and trying to actually put too much money back into the pockets of shareholders rather than investing in their own businesses? And I wanted to get your, your thought on, on whether he was right or wrong about well, that. It, yeah, Andrew, it's all case specific. We say that Berkshire will buy our stock in it and will buy it aggressively at 120% of book value. I know that at that price, the shareholders who stay are gaining on a per share basis because we're doing that. If we were to buy it in at 200% of book value, our shareholders that we're staying would be, would be, would be penalized by that action. It's solely a function of what you're paying uh, compared to the price. If you and I had a, if we owned a McDonald's stand together and I bought you out at 80 cents on the dollar, you, you know, I bought in your stock, I would be ahead of the game uh, for doing so. If I paid you 120% of what it was worth, I'd be behind the game. And that, it, it's that simple an equation for managements, but many managements just decide we're going to buy an X billion dollars worth of stock and we're going to do it over the next 12 months or 24 months. That's no way to buy anything. I mean, the way to buy things is to buy them when you think they're selling for less than they're worth. And when you do that, you are favoring the, the continuing shareholder. Now, in doing it, you have a moral obligation to make sure that the, the exiting shareholder has received all the facts, and you know, just like you would if you're buying the person out of the McDonald's stand. But it's not a complicated uh, 
equation at all to figure out whether it's beneficial or not beneficial to repurchase shares. We know how to do it at Berkshire, and we'll be doing it this way 10 years or 20 years from now. Hey, Joe? Hey, yeah, hey, Warren. Uh, good, good to see you. I hear you. Hi, Joe. You must have been talking a lot. Again, uh, you know, once you get started, it's hard to get you, uh, get you to stop. You sound a little bit hoarse, but I, uh, and, you got, and you got two and a half hours <laughs> to go. You got two and a half hours to go. Um, Here's, here's well, some... I get paid by the word, so I... <laughs> we kind of do, uh, so actually. Joe. Yeah, we kind of do. Um, I'll tell you what, what, what I was saying. I don't know how to ask it, actually. I, this morning, I was... Uh, I listened on the way in now. I got headphones, and I got my iPhone and everything, and I downloaded something from the cloud. So that's about as much as I know about the cloud. And I'm wondering about your techno, uh, technological expertise, because I, as, as I recall, I don't think you bought... I don't think you bought Microsoft. I don't think you ever bought really Apple. I don't know if you ever bought Intel. I don't know if you ever bought Cisco. Uh, I, mean, I mean, you have sort of an aversion, not an aversion, but maybe you don't feel like you have the expertise, and yet that changed somehow with IBM. And I, I, I've never really understood that. Maybe it's because they're such a services uh, company now, and they've got so many uh, established relationships that it's uh, relationships that it's almost an annuity. Or, or do you actually understand what? type of cloud strategy that a company like IBM should have right now. Because I remember Carl Icahn buying Motorola. And I said, he has no idea what kind of phones to put out there, or Biogen. I, I doubt if he knew, had any idea how any of the, the biotechnology products worked. And yet, he knew how to do that. Is it the same with you, or, or how did it change with IBM? Well, I got, I got great news for you, Joe. You're only the second dumbest guy in the country about the cloud. Uh, you know, I, I, I've got you beat out in that respect. <laughs> the, uh, what, we, what we do, uh, and, I, and there's no question that I, 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 I have far less technical knowledge about how IBM works than I do about how Wells Fargo or Coca-Cola works. But we do have 70 plus companies, and when we talk to them, we, we learn something of their plans, and we learn about competitive products, and we uh, we make some estimates. We'll take Wells Fargo. Uh, my guess is that Wells Fargo, IBM's their biggest supplier now. My guess is that IBM will be their biggest supplier five or ten years from now. I think that there's a, uh, a significant difference. Uh, sometimes the, the location of the information actually has to be geographic, spe geographically specific. But there's certainly uh, differences in the degree of security that people feel they need uh, in terms of storing uh, information on the cloud. And as, as I talk to CEOs and I talk to our own managers, uh, I feel pretty good about uh, IBM's future, probably more so in what they call the hybrid cloud than, than, uh, than the cloud that you, uh, you generally read about. Uh, uh, IBM is a very, it's a trusted organization. It's, it's an innovative organization. And uh, they're competing against a lot of other people that are innovative too. But uh, it's not a it's not a winner take all game. I mean, search uh, you yeah. might say comes very close to a winner take all game. Uh, cloud computing is not a winner take all game. I understand. Yeah. So there's a hybrid cloud. So right there, you uh, you're not the second. He just one up you with yeah, the hybrid cloud. Yeah. You just cloud. Uh, you just one up me on that one, and, and you tried not to, but. Uh, there's, you know, they, you're, you're crazy like, I bet you know a lot more about IBM's uh, strategy uh, for, for the future. Don't bet too much. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, but, but you're, you know, I, when, I, you, I, when you put it that way, with, with Wells Fargo, knowing that, uh, and they probably have relationships like that with, I don't know how many of the S&P 500, and, and you're probably right, that's probably gonna stay, but see, you're not really looking at it like an Apple or like some type of uh, disruptive, innovative technology now. You're looking at it as an established uh, sort of a, a, a brand name that, that's not as dependent, I don't think, on innovation as some of the newer tech players. Yeah, well, Amazon, for example, I, I mean, they, they just gave their figures out on, 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 uh, on cloud computing uh, uh, a few weeks ago. And, and you know, they have... They, they, I, I would guess they have far more customers by number, perhaps, uh, than an IBM because they made themselves open to all kinds of developers, and 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 that's probably a very good business model. I mean, Jeff Bezos is a very, very, very smart guy, and he, he got in early, but 
what, but what he's doing does not, uh, it is not a winner-take-all game. And, and, and different kinds of organizations have different needs. Uh, American Express is, is a huge customer uh, of, of uh, uh, IBM. Our Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad, uh, we pay a lot of money to uh, IBM every year. And, and we're very, very, very likely to continue paying a lot of money. Uh, and they will, they'll modify their offerings to things that are more useful to us as, as we go along. Uh, but I, listen, Microsoft's going to prosper, Amazon's going to prosper, you know, uh, Oracle's going to prosper, but I think IBM's going to prosper too. And I think what they have done uh, from a capital structure standpoint, on top of that, I like very much. I mean, this is a company with, two, they had 250 million of options when they had a billion, six or seven uh, 100 million shares outstanding, and now they're down to 985 million with, with, uh, with you know, virtually no options. One of the interesting things about an IBM, and it's true of other tech companies, uh, IBM uh, earns infinite returns on, on a tangible common equity. I mean, those are very good businesses, not just IBM. You can, you can take the others, but those are basically very good businesses. We earn a lot, a lot of money to Burlington Northern, but we have a huge tangible investment. Uh, there is no net tangible investment. They are earning infinite returns on, on net tangible equity at IBM. All right, gentlemen, we're going to slip in a break very quickly. Welcome back to Squawk Box, everyone. Berkshire Hathaway shareholders saw a new name on the exhibit floor this year, IBM. The company brought Watson to the annual meeting, allowing shareholders to play Jeopardy against it. I have to tell you, I didn't see a whole lot of winners there. CEO Ginny Rometty, though, says that Watson is much more than a quiz show expert. Sometimes people think, well, then Watson is just a search engine. No. Or it's just artificial intelligence. No. And really what it is is take natural language, and it learns any industry, then combine it with a system that constantly learns, never forgets. But then one more thing, as you and I were talking about, when you saw the demo on cancer, it really deals with the gray zone and how we make decisions. So, what does that mean? Like, the, you and I do this naturally. Well, everybody does it naturally. When you go to make a decision on something, you form lots of hypotheses, and your brain does this very quickly. And then you test it against everything you know, and you come up with an answer, and you're confident or not. So Watson forms millions of hypotheses, tests it against everything it knows, forms a percentage of confidence, but the difference is it can tell you how confident, what data it needs to be more, or the evidence for an answer. Is it already profitable, or is it something that you ramp it up and it becomes profitable quickly? How does that? It's a service, so it's gonna, it ramps up over time by its nature. It's a cloud service, and it is a really important part of, as you know, one of our big strategic imperatives, we call them, is data and analytics, which is already for us a $17 billion business last year. And in fact, grew 7%, first quarter grew 12. I mean, so it's an important part of that, and this will be a play for the long run. So Warren, question for you. Did you get a chance to play Watson uh, in Jeopardy? I didn't get a chance to play Watson in Jeopardy, but I, I can offer a couple of interesting comments. The, uh, at Geico, we, have, we are spending millions and millions of dollars with Watson. and, and we, uh, we've been working with it for probably a year or so, and uh, it, there are a lot of possibilities with it. And, and we're learning a lot as we go along. I mean, it, we're not we're not to the finish point by a long shot, but we do consider it something of potentially uh, great value uh, in terms of our insurance business. Uh, the one thing I was thinking of doing this year was to work into the, my report the fact that there would be a third party at the uh, sitting up there with Charlie and Munger and myself at the meeting and have people speculating about this being my successor and maybe having a some uh, having it hidden in some way and then unveiling it and waiting for the first question which you could have asked and you could have said well let's get right to the meat of it who's going to be Warren's successor and then have Watson rumble a little bit and finally say I am <laughs> sort of going back to hell in terms of 2001. Right. You know, with, with Geico, what are you using Watson to do? Well, we're, we're training Watson. Watson learns. And, and basically, with, but, it, but it's not going to know anything that we haven't taught it, I mean, in terms of putting in the information. But it learns. And, and it would be enormously valuable, for example, uh, just in terms of training thousands of, of new people who act as agents for us on the phone. I mean, they have to be licensed and that sort of thing. And, and it can be... It may, and this is a long way off, but it, 
it possibly could could be uh, uh, responding to tens of thousands of phone calls that we get every day. Wow. day. And, uh, it, it can be helpful in terms of claims, and it you know it it, it can learn a lot, and it can uh, it can it has to learn what humans mean when they talk to it. But mm -hmm. I think the the most exciting thing right now, of course, is is, is in the health field because mm -hmm. uh, you have millions of doctors around the world that can't, can't possibly keep up with all the scientific specialist information coming along. And they have, you know, if somebody, if I have prostate cancer, my doctor's seen maybe 500 people with prostate cancer in his life or 1,000 and treated them. And, and he draws certain deductions from what this test meant and then that test meant. But imagine getting that in the millions and having that all processed. So I think, I think, I think a lot of things are going to happen in medicine. Okay. Joe has a question, too. Question about the Geico headband on Freddie Roach, uh, Warren. Was that your idea? Did, did, I saw that. <laughs> did you know about that? <laughs> uh, well, no, I didn't know about that specifically. But at, at our annual meeting, actually, uh, there was a movie where uh, I, ch I, ch I challenged Floyd Mayweather here a few months ago. And uh, 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 we, uh, we got in the ring together. I was the Berkshire bomber. So... Uh, <laughs> He didn't have that second in there with Freddie at that, that time. Uh, he uh, he was I, drinking water. I was drinking Coca-Cola. Yeah, <laughs> we had a lot of fun together, actually. I bet you did. But I was amazing. It was just amazing that Geico. Uh, you you know what what advertising you've talked about it before. What what advertising has done for Geico, and there it was. There it was. I was just like, what is like, what does that hit? And it, and I saw Geico, and I just shook my head and said, Buffett. Buffett. Oh. Yeah. Well, yeah. We 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 spend a, we spend about a one point. I think we're the fifth largest advertiser in the United States, and and we spent twenty million or so when we took control in nineteen ninety five, and we'll spend a one point three billion now. And uh, but advertising doesn't do you any good unless your product delivers what you promise, and and uh, obviously Geico's product does. So yeah. uh, here's one more ad. Fifteen minutes can save you fifteen percent. <laughs> Now, again, I'm in Omaha with Warren Buffett, who's the chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, just coming off of this uh, this year's annual meeting weekend. Warren, a lot of the questions that I've heard that were asked by other media, that were asked by other shareholders that tried to approach you, the one thing that people want to know most is what you think about the market right now. And um, obviously, it's not something you look at a day, by a day-by-day -day basis, but you have, from time to time, made calls that the market is overvalued or the market is undervalued. Where, where do we stand right now? based on what you've looked at historically? Very occasionally over a, really a 60-year period, uh, it's been very clear that the markets really is overvalued or dramatically undervalued. Most of the time, I don't have the faintest idea of whether it's on the high side or the low side. And when you get the extremes, 1973 and 4 was the cheapest market I've ever seen, including our recent panic. Uh, but our recent panic was, was, was such that you could clearly say stocks were undervalued. Back around 1999, 2000, I said they really were overvalued. What you can say now is that, uh, not very helpful, but the market against normal interest rates is on the high side of valuation, not not dangerously high, but on the high side of valuation. On the other hand, if, if these interest rates were to continue for 10 years, stocks would be extremely cheap now. And, and uh, the one thing you can say is stocks are cheaper than bonds. Uh, very definitely. And what we've seen low interest rates now for six years or so, I mean, rates that we really wouldn't have thought possible, uh, particularly in Europe where they've gone negative. And that's continued a long time. And of course, we saw them continue for decades in Japan. So uh, we own stocks. We're happy owning stocks. We look at stocks as parts of businesses. We don't try to guess which way the market's going. We have no idea what the market's going to do next year. Charlie and I never talk about it. Uh, if these low interest rates prevail for five or ten years, stocks, you will look back and say stocks were very cheap. If interest rates normalize, you will look back and say they weren't so cheap. So if you were a betting man, not that you are, but if you were a betting man, would you assume that interest rates will remain low in the United States for the next five to ten years? Well, they fooled me so far. So I've been wrong. I would have thought by now you would have seen much more, uh, much higher rates than we have now, which is essentially nothing. Uh, it looks to me like the, they'll stay, they're certainly going to stay low as long as 
Europe keeps following the present policies, and Europe will probably keep following those policies till they see their European economy come back fairly strong. I don't know the answer to that, and I, I don't bet on it. What I do is if I, if I could, if I had an easy way and a non-risk way of shorting a whole lot of 20 or 30 year bonds, I would do it. But that's not my game, and it's very, it, it, it can't be done in the kind of quantity that would make sense for us. Uh, but I think that, I think bonds are very overvalued, I'll put it that way. Now, whether the central bank has the capacity to keep them in that situation uh, almost indefinitely. So uh, we'll see what happens on that. Although every expectation is that the Fed will at least start raising interest rates probably this year, maybe September, maybe December, if not, certainly next year. Correct or no? Well, I think you're right that the expectation is that. But, <laughs> but I think it's difficult. And I, not impossible. I mean, the Fed can do what the Fed wants to do. But I think if you have negative rates in Europe, I think it. I think there are a lot of consequences to raising rates significantly here. The important thing to remember in economics, people forget it, is you can never just do one thing. I mean, it's like physics. You cannot just change one variable and not have anything else change in the world. And when, when Poland borrows at negative interest rates, it has an effect on what we can do without changing export prices, all, all kinds of things. So, Meaning that our rates look so much more attractive, people come flooding into our issues, the, money will keep the dollar gets stronger, and you don't want to even continue that curve. Becky, I'm sitting with a lot of money in euros that has to be in euros at our insurance company in Germany. I'm getting a minus rate on that. Well, that gets your attention. <laughs> if, if, if you were sitting with some money, you know, in your billfold, and every day a little bit of it got clipped away, you know, you start wondering, why is this in my billfold? And so it pushes behavior. Interest rates push behavior, like, you know, uh, incredibly. And we are not immune from what goes on in a market as big as the euro market. And uh, I think it's difficult for us to raise rates significantly, certainly. I mean, I cannot envision us, for example, having a 4% or something right here with negative rates in Europe. Now, the gradations, you can argue as to how much effect they might have. But uh, this is a very unusual situation, and, and I don't know how it plays out. Is that a box, potentially, that the, the Fed has put itself into? I mean, we, we've seen what happened with QE. I know you were a huge supporter of what Bernanke and company was doing that point. I know that you have said that you would probably do a lot of the same things that they had done. But we haven't seen all the consequences play out. What, what possibilities? Well, I mean, every, every action in economics creates some other uh, uh, fallout from it. But I think the Fed has done the right thing, 100% yeah. uh, the right thing. And I think probably the, the uh, ECB is, is doing the right thing in terms of their situation. But they still have consequences, and it's hard to, it's hard to envision all the consequences. Are, we, have, gonna, we have not seen this movie before. <laughs> we haven't seen this movie before, but you've got an active imagination. What are some of the play lines that you've thought through in worst-case scenarios? What, well, what could we, be the consequences? We issued three, three, uh, three billion dollars worth of euros the other day, and, and our average interest rate probably was around 1 percent, and they're probably due in on an average, there were three different issues, maybe 12 years or something like that. Uh, You're happy getting 1% on your money for tw over 12 years? Oh, well, for the, for the, for the, for I'm happy you're paying 1%. Yeah, you're happy paying it, right. And incidentally, if rates go back to what seemed like normal not so long ago, you know, we might buy those bonds back at 60 cents on the dollar, you know. Uh, right. Uh, well, we'll see what happens, but I don't think anything terrible is going to happen to me because I'm paying 1%. <laughs> Maybe not to you, but what are the unintended consequences to the rest of the system? You know, that's hard to tell. Uh, historically, I would have thought the consequences uh, would be significant inflation at some point, and, and that has not happened. Uh, I mean, we've kept rates low here now for six years, and, and now you're seeing something even more extreme. And uh, you even have a central bank saying we want 2 percent inflation. And uh, so it's, it, it's very interesting. And undoubtedly, we'll look back five or 10 years from now and something will have happened. We'll say, well, that was the obvious consequence. But I'm not, I, I can't tell you what the obvious What about is. deflation and the Japanese situation? You, you yeah. pointed to that earlier, 20 I, years. A long time. Well, that's, in theory, you have to have deflation to, to make negative rates to make any sense. I mean, 
it, it's a strange situation when somebody owes us money at our insurance company in Europe. I don't want them to pay us. I, I'd rather have a good receivable. I'm collecting it in a year. Normally, you want to collect your receivables as fast as you can. And if we collect it, we're uh, we're going to actually have that money depreciate uh, right away. And whereas if we have the receivable, it's still 100, 100 cents on the dollar. <laughs> Right. We, we have much more coming up from Warren Buffett, a lot more this morning. We will also be joined a little later by uh, Charlie Munger and Bill Gates. Warren Buffett owned shares of all of Berkshire's big four investments before the current CEOs took office. Again, these are the four big CEOs, the four big companies, blue chip companies, that uh, Berkshire Hathaway is the primary investor, is the, the, the leading investor in. Of those four, though, only one of these was not there before Buffett started buying. This is a CEO who was CEO-elect when it was first announced that uh, Buffett had accumulated a significant stake. I asked Ginny Rometty what she thought when she heard that Buffett was buying into the company. I had just been named. It maybe had been only a, a two weeks or something at, at the time. And uh, when we had found out, and the, obviously I called him that minute to talk to him, and uh, and couldn't and you have did been. Smile a little bit. Oh, oh I, I <laughs> smile. I'm still smiling. <laughs> so uh, I remember I immediately called because um, obviously I had just been named, and actually had not even been effective yet, but. I would be the one he would have a long-term relationship with. And, uh, and he couldn't have been more complimentary. And again, it's all about a business model and the things that are important and to steward the company for the long term and you know and he's true to that i mean to this day i mean he'll talk to me about as you know we've made many divestitures and you know as our models about moving to higher value and uh, he, he certainly would agree you don't want revenue that doesn't bring value to a company so when we divest seven billion that loses a half a billion that's a good thing to do as you continue to move forward and so he's very true to those principles about value that's sustainable for the long term so i'll, I'll always remember that first phone call call and uh, couldn't have been more pleasant and uh, and more reinforcing about it, the business model and the quality of the company uh, is the feedback that he gives you. You know, Warren Buffett has a very unique style of investing. He will never do a hostile takeover. He's not interested in battling management. And I just wonder if you all think if that he's the best possible poison pill out there. Having Warren Buffett as an owner it almost seems, it seems like it's unassailable to anybody else who's going to come in. Yeah, I don't think of him as a poison pill. I think of him as a tremendous asset mm -hmm. and a tremendous advantage and a privilege. And so those are the, the that's the thought that that I have. And and I was I, I joined the Coca-Cola company in, in 1985, and and he became a shareholder a few years after that. So. Almost all my life uh, working for the company, uh, he's been uh, a shareholder, and he's, the company has benefited uh, in very so many different ways of, of having him as a share owner, as a as a director. Uh, but I do always recall the story um, when um, that was recited by the late Don Keo, uh, who would say, who uh, one day. Um, you know the, the the price of the uh, the stock started going up a little bit, and uh, he he picked up the phone and and he always says called Warren and said you wouldn't be buying a few of our stock, uh, and he, apparently uh, he said yes and and so that's how he started. And, yeah, I, uh, I think I feel the same way. I mean this is not from a defensive poison pill, but from a it's such a privilege to have him be our largest owner at Wells Fargo. Uh, it is, I mean, who wouldn't want the best investor uh, the world's ever known and maybe the finest human being, uh, and, and we've all talked about that, to be a major investor. Not that we don't care about our other investors, we care about all of them, but it is, it's a privilege. And, and we want to earn that respect and, and make him proud of his investment. Like we want to make all of our shareholders proud of their investment. That's kind of how we think about that, yeah, think as the, opposed to a defensive perspective. You know, the, the key thing you know with Warren is he's not patronizing. Yeah. He, he tells you exactly yeah. Yeah. as it is, and that's fantastic. But the other thing to think about, because none of us are saying this lightly, it really is a privilege and honor, because think of how many people Warren is saying no to. All right, for the very reason that they would love to have that association for a variety of reasons. What's most important is you have to earn it 
right. And Warren has to believe in your business model, and he has to believe in you as a leader. And unless those two connect, he doesn't go. And that's a good point, because other companies he's associated with, sometimes it's taken a preferred shares offer to get him in the door. You guys he bought on the open market. Right. Right. Okay. Again, Warren Buffett is here and has been listening to all of this. Uh, Warren, one of the things that I, I look at these companies and think uh, they're probably, it'd be very difficult for an activist investor to come into any of these four with you as the major shareholder. Um, is that a fair way of looking at things? Yeah, I, I think it probably is. I, I, I think that when we have close to 15 percent of American Express or when we have uh, 9 percent of Coke or almost 10 percent of Wells Fargo, I, uh, I think it'd be very silly for an activist to uh, come in and say, you know, double your dividend today or buy in a whole lot more stock or whatever it might be that they were proposing, because I, I think the companies are well run and I think their financial policies are sound. And, and if you have sound financial policies in a well run company, uh, the best thing to do is just sit back and enjoy it. Well, the, the one company that has been approached very recently was Coca-Cola uh, with David Winters and the efforts that, that he's undertaken. Originally, when David Winters came in, you said that you had given it some thought. You hadn't thought about it before, but you were looking at what he was proposing. And he, he, had a, he had a good point. His math was way off, but, but he had a good point about the, about the level uh, of the number of shares involved in the, uh, in the uh, option program or restricted stock program and the period over which it would be issued. And so I, like I say, his math was way off, uh, but, but, but uh, I, I agreed with him that that policy should be modified in some way. And uh, I commend the Coca-Cola company terrifically. Uh, the woman that headed the uh, committee, uh, Mel. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the comp committee, Mel, uh, she, she worked very, very hard. She contacted other companies, she contacted investors, she thought it through, and they designed a program that made terrific sense for the shareholders and, and, uh, uh, and, and, the, and the management and directors embraced it. Why do you take this different approach to investing, the idea that you would never do a hostile offer, the idea that you would never um, really publicly get into things like this? Why? How'd you get to that point of view well, and why did, did you do it? I did, I did some semi-hostile things very early on and it wasn't much fun. And it, it just isn't the way to go through life. Uh, uh, why not find a wonderful company and, and join them rather than find a so-so company and, and get in a fight? It, uh, so that was 50 years ago or more. and, and uh, Berkshire itself was semi-hostile, although the chairman of the board and the brother of the president both were on my side, but the, the president himself wasn't. Uh, and it just, it just doesn't make much sense when you can find very good companies that, that will welcome you, uh, assuming you aren't going to try and uh, take them over. Uh, uh, so that, that's been my game now for 50 years. But I, I must admit that in, in, there, there were a couple of instances in my youth where I, I took on what I thought were bad managements, and, and they deserved to be taken on, but it was not a life I wanted to live. Okay, great. Um, again, we have much more to come from Warren Buffett when we return. Um, Joe, I'll, I'll, I'll send it back to you in the studio, and uh, we're going to open this up for a, a lot more all play when we come back, too. What about that house across the street from Warren? Did, did you guys see that? The, the, the person's oh, asked. Yeah, I did. The person wants 10 shares of uh, Berkshire. That doesn't seem like a lot. Yeah. Sean Keogh lived in that house.